Again, my name is Monica Black, and I'm the Associate Director of the UT Humanities Center. I'm very excited to introduce this evening's Cocktails and Conversations speaker. Her name is Professor Emily Bibbins, and she is a professor of 4D and time-based art at the University of Tennessee in Oxford, and we are delighted to have her with us this evening. Professor Bibbins was raised in Southern Louisiana. She studied biology, but switched to art when she realized that there are limits to what science can explain. Um, particularly, I would think questions of meaning and questions of why. And I think those are probably questions that animate at least some corners of Professor Bivens' work. Uh, Professor Bivens creates installations using um, stop motion animation that allow her to animate uh, inanimate things like dead animals, for example, taxidermy, and video and sound projection embedded in and on objects. She works with domestic objects like bed frames and mirror frames uh, from vanities, for example, sometimes found objects of that kind, which she manipulates to hold new narratives and to disrupt the familiar. Professor Bivens is a recipient of the 2019 Anne and Steve Bailey Opportunity Grant and a 2019 Tennessee Arts Commission Individual Artist Fellowship. Her work has been shown at Skulpturenhus in, in Stockholm in Sweden, at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver, Colorado, at Temple Contemporary in Philadelphia, and at Demo Project in Springfield, Illinois. Her collaborative work with The Bridge Club has been presented at Press Street for Prospect Plus, 3 Plus in New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Santa Barbara, California, at the Texas Biennial in San Antonio, and many other locations. Uh, Professor Bivens received her BFA from Colorado State University and her MFA from the University of Colorado at Boulder. And in just a moment, I, who am, uh, I'll admit, somewhat of a novice in using um, webinar, Zoom webinar technology, I'm going to turn things over to, to um, Professor Bivens, but it'll take me just a second to do that. And, but don't worry, it's all going to happen. And, uh, and we'll, we'll hear from Professor Bivens in just a moment. I hope you enjoy this evening's presentation. And um, yeah, let's, let's, let's start the show. Thank you. I was saying the most intelligent and fascinating things just now. I realize you couldn't hear it, but rest assured, it was brilliant. Um, let, me, let me start again. So I wanted to thank um, the UT Humanities Center and Amy Elias and Monica Black for inviting me and Joan Murray for facilitating it. Um, it is so lovely to be here tonight, and there are a lot of ways to spend an evening and many people to both cocktail and conversate with. So thank you for being here. What I'm gonna talk to you about is the artwork that I create. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. All right. There we go, it's working. All right. So I'm gonna to talk to you about the work that I create, um, but also a few of the ideas and the sources that I lean into. That's kind of the opportunity of a lecture versus just experiencing the work, right? Um, is that you're able to explore those things that are so intrinsic to the work and yet not explicit in the viewing of the work. So I am a professor of time-based art and I know that that is not a title that invokes a ton of clarity. 
Um, it is a field that is not limited to video art, cinema art, sound art, performance, uh, animation, and for me, installation. Well, what you're going to see is video and animation work and some documentation of sculptures and objects. This particular body of work, um, anyway, that I'm going to talk about tonight is meant to be experienced in physical space as installation. So I'm going to do a bit of leading you through and reconstructing. Time and space are so inextricably intertwined in the way that I both practice and teach that I prefer to say that I am a practitioner of time and space, which I think sounds pretty cool. Um, my work addresses in its broadest sense, uh, a quandary about a lost connection between the human and non-human world and also a shrinking wildness that I can't or maybe don't want to rectify. That seems pretty straightforward, at least for a Thursday night. But perhaps what I want to get to is a bit more aberrant. When I say non-human and talk about wildness, you may be thinking only of animals and maybe of being in the forest, but to me, it encompasses so much more. I'm thinking here of the non-human in terms of inanimate objects and their ability to allude to and carry the residue of their own history and making and use. Um, if we get carried away tonight, which I hope we do, I might bring up an object's ability to make a metaphorical beeline to new owners or other volitional activities of the inanimate. But for now, let's just warm up by saying that objects can be very powerful storytellers. Um, they have an inability to both lie and be explicit, which is quite a skill. I also include in this crevasse of disconnect between the human and non-human world, all of the things we cannot see and choose not to feel. These are most often things that are situated in between fact and fiction or real and unreal, ghosts, spiritual entities of all kinds, life forces, and perhaps the most controversial of all, canned meat, which I absolutely refuse to feel. Um, but there are more, of course. Um, let's just start there. I'm particularly interested in ideas that push against each other, but cannot touch lest they become the others and then not themselves at all. So alive and dead, past and present, old and new, human and non-human, inside and outside, true and false, found and lost. In my practice, I'm collecting all these things and making experiences to deal with what I have named the oppositional and. These are two words that are typically joined by the conjunction or, but where the or is removed and replaced with and. Um, in this phrasing, the ideas are pulled together, but because of the nature of what they mean, they are simultaneously repelled, creating an invisible tension that can be felt. Um, I'm naming and all of these things that cannot be contained, wildness more generally, and I'm a huge fan of it. Um, the work that I'm gonna show you, the next work that I'm gonna show you is um, a piece that is called Perpetual Motion. Um, both um, this piece and the last piece would be projected life size on a wall. And um, this one is presented in the shape of an oval reminiscent of a mirror. Um, this was made in 2020. Uh, the woman here um, in a crocheted straight jacket perpetually spins as she gazes both longingly and lovingly at her dead pigeon. It's an optimistic piece. The piece highlights the confines of persistent grief and what is seemingly banal. Um, this work came to fruition in pieces. It started about 15 years ago when I commissioned an artisan in Ecuador to make a crocheted straight jacket. I must have had a logic at the time, but um, it was not clear. The woman in the video, Rachel Severe uh, Dallery, uh, was visiting my studio and picked up this garment. And in my memory, though this could be a little reconstruction, there was this magical moment where there was almost like a smart spark of connection as the object um, acknowledged that Rachel had come after uh, 15 years of waiting. 
Um, I also, in seeing that interaction, saw this work whole in an instant as if the work itself had been waiting to be made as well. It makes sense that Rachel picked up this garment. Um, she's an amazing artist who makes these beautifully, beautiful crocheted forms that simultaneously imply body and vessel. Um, now the pigeon is another story. I became interested in being a pigeoneer uh, and had been eyeing the pigeons at the Tennessee State Fair. So in 2016, I took the plunge. I started with very little information. So I really had to lean on the experts in the bird and poultry pavilion at the state fair. I selected a pair of pigeons. Um, one was really spunky and kind of skittish and I would say kind of svelte. Um, the other that I selected was fluffy and docile and liked to be held. So I asked the owners if these were good pigeons, not knowing. And what I heard was, oh yeah, this is as good as it gets. But you've all been in the Berg Pavilion, right? It is loud. So um, also the gentleman had a fairly thick regional accent and my ear was uh, not attuned or skilled to it. So he actually could have said, yeah, but one of them is sick or yeah, but you can't burn a candle from both ends of the wick. I don't know, I can't be certain anymore, but the crux of the story here is I was either conned into buying a very sick pigeon for $5 or I was given a fair laughs warning about the condition of a modestly priced pigeon or just given some really good sound sleeping advice. Regardless, within 72 hours, Pudge, as we were calling him, was dead. I was devastated. I was not the only one. Pidge, the spunky one, had been pretty quiet and I think pretty happy, but when Pudge died, there was no sleep. She cooed, she carried on, and even being a pigeoneer newbie, I knew she was incredibly, incredibly sad. This is a very serious story and um, my despair was very genuine and deep, but I'm about to make a really funny joke. For quite a few days afterwards, Pidge turned into a morning dove. I'm assuming you are all laughing right now. Anyway, I did what I do when I'm caught off guard or not ready to accept an outcome of any sort, which is to double bag it, put it in my freezer where it waits for years. It's important for me to discuss the intricacies of um, it's important for me to discuss all of the intricacies that contribute to this piece and acknowledge the part that feels very out of my control, but requires me to be receptive and attuned. The work on its own though, is about being locked in this perpetual cycle of care and mourning for issues that are often dismissed for their banality or willfully ignored because the conditions seem so incredibly unchangeable that care itself seems like some futile act of self-destruction. Our environmental crisis, persistent systematic discrimination rise to the top of that list for me, but there are others. Um, this next piece that I paused on here is um, what I've started to think of as a uh, companion piece to the piece about Pudge's companion, Pidge. That's a mouthful, but I'll explain. The two artworks were actually made many, many years apart, but I now see them as sort of part of this larger conversation. I made this when newly widowed Pidge became my studio companion. She had free time. <clears throat> so what happens is that audience members look through the vision tester that you saw before. This is a telebinocular um, and you view this video of a person holding a live pigeon to her chest. The video is split into two circular images, one toned red and one toned blue. And when you look through the telebinocular, you might see a single video with natural color but if you're colorblind, you'll either see red or a blue image. The video lasts as long as it takes for the pigeon to stop struggling and to fall asleep. So on one level, this is a vision test, but on another is this test of your recognition of captivity and struggle and resignation. 
it distinguishes the act of seeing from, well, the act of seeing. Um, so as I mentioned, this functions as an installation where distinct pieces work together to form a new idea. These two pieces would be across from each other so that as an audience member turns to look at the video through the telebinocular, Rachel is either looking at the audience member, looking at the live pigeon, or looking at her own dead pigeon, or also turning away simultaneously. I think of this as a sort of choreography of the audience within the work that has chance and variable infused into it. Most of the work that I'm showing you tonight is composed of a static camera long take. Um, this move away from the edited or the constructed reality has to do with the way I use space and the gaze of the audience. Um, I imagine that when the audience member turns around and finds Rachel still staring and still entrapped in this care and mourning, it would change the way they viewed both pieces. So this is an example of how I frame my work more broadly around rhizomatic thinking discussed in Guattari and Deleuze's A Thousand Plateaus. Um, the rhizome is a structure made up of multiple interrelated entities without fixed beginnings or endings. Um, the most commonly associated illustration would be the ginger root. There are uh, separate and maybe seemingly singular plants, but beyond our vision underground, they are attached to a root system that is expansive. So both connection and difference are the main pillars of this philosophy. This really appeals to me because by positing two in conjunction with each other, sitting bot side by side, one, me, can acknowledge this interconnected multiplicity. Um, there's an order, there's a connection and a logic, but it's not wholly visible and not fixed in time or space. I recognize this model in my individual work, my practice, and in my reading preference. I am particularly moved by the work of the writer Ali Smith um, in her book, Artful, which is part ghost story, part lecture, part literary and art criticism, and all tangential and rhizomatic. She says, you can't step into the same story twice, or maybe it's that stories, books, art can't step into the same person twice. Um, she goes on to talk about our mutability as conditioned by age, and I would add experience. Um, she closes this thought by saying that real art will hold us in an elasticity and with a generosity that allow for our comings and goings, because come, then go, we will, and in that order. I'm really counting on this in my work. I'm banking on the experience of work being challenged by what and when you have seen each aspect of the interconnected elements. This piece um, that you're looking at right here is a piece from an older piece from 2017. It's called Stereo, and it's made from this modified tube radio cabinet. Um, it has surveillance cameras, various electronics, projectors, video, stop motion animation, and is perhaps an extreme version of what she's talking about. The audience is invited to press the original radio buttons to change the video that is being rear projected on the screen below the nest. They see one of six videos, depending on what button they um, press. They can see a stop motion animation of a finch caught in a hair nest, a live video uh, feed of the top of their head, which is a joy to see um, from the chandelier that is above them. They can see a stop motion of a cardinal caught in the hair nest or a pre-recorded video of someone standing in the space behind where the viewer is standing, or they can see a live um, feed video that is taken from this um, space right here. So, um, there are cute, a few key concepts here. One is that chance plays a really big role in what or whom you see. There's a significant chance that you will miss something, but if you don't miss something, then you are very aware that you caught something, which is even better. Um, 
that what you were looking at when you saw the, um, the uh, vanity is um, actually the surveillance camera and those images that would be rear projected into the nest um, would absolutely change your understanding of what it meant to even stand in the space. Um, in Ali Smith's novel, How to Be Both, she challenges the linearity of story by creating these two interconnected stories. I was blown away by this. Um, one is about a 21st century teenage girl, and the other is about a 15th century Italian painter. They are both ghost stories. Um, but here's the trick. Two versions of the book were published simultaneously, one in which the story of the 21st century teenage girl comes first, and the other where the story of the 15th century Italian painter comes first. It is up to chance which of the story colors your view of the other and how to make sense of them. Because we can't unknow or unsee, and because what we experience innately changes us, the story can't step into the same person twice. We are mutable. Our experience, our experiences mutate us. For the work that I'm discussing today, it's important for me to show video works, sculptures and animations and found objects as part of a whole that the audience can and should be experience in both an order and for a duration of their own volition. I teach editing and I love it. I talk at great length about the joys of shot to shot relationships, but in my installations, I am actually creating the shot to shot relationships I'm, um, in space, but without presupposing the outcome. I take out the bread and butter of what we do in linear film and video work, which is to control the gaze. So in this work, there's not just chance, but a necessity that you're going to experience one moving image, you must turn your back and miss another. It leads me to the next couple of works that are made in conversation with the artist Donna Moore and um, the artist Gwen Montgomery, who were both in much of the work. While these specific examples are part of my larger body of work, I can't think of this work as only mine because it really, uh, in, uh, um, is inextricably linked with them and their presence, their bodies. Um, in this work, uh, Pendulum, it's from 2018. Two projection screens are made from antique dresser mirrors and they face each other on the floor. Um, the projected videos, let's play them. The projected videos are of two women walking towards and away from each other down the same winding dirt trail, continuously offering each other the same dead chicken. As this video continues, um, the women become out of sync. So they no longer meet face to face on the road, but they offer the dead chicken to the back of the adjacent woman or to an empty road or to the audience standing in the middle of the two mirrors. So um, as you acknowledge one, you again, turn your back on another, depending on when the audience enters this space, they will have a very different experience. The two women will either come together over time or fall apart. I think of this as a metaphor for how we offer each other the condition of the world and the treatment of the people in it, despite all of our hopes and efforts. Um, this is Donna's Road. This is Donna's Long Dead Chicken. We had used it the year before in another artwork, then we froze it, and it still smelled really awful, but we held and offered it despite. Um, it did die of natural causes, in case you were worried. I do have some guilt, though, over another animal that I want to talk about now. Um, the next piece that I'm going to show you is called Pet Hawk. Um, in this work, a woman continually tries to pet a hawk. The hawk becomes agitated when her hand approaches, but it doesn't fly away. Perhaps the hawk is lured in by the false promise of the mink stole. I made this work after reading the book, H is for Hawk by Helen McDonald. This is nonfiction and simultaneously about three things. 
I love things that are about lots of things. It is an autobiography about bereavement and the irrevocable. It is a biography of the author of The Once and Future King, T.H. White. And it's about his struggle with societal elements of cruelty and control. Um, it is also about how to train hawks, specifically some of the wildest goshawks. Um, both T.H. White and Helen McDonald are drawn to training goshawks because it marked the opportunity to separate themselves from the human world and immerse themselves into an undeniable wildness. I feel this acutely. The artist Gwen Montgomery sent me this book and is featured in this work um, because I was in a sense training birds, albeit in the post-mortem condition by making stop motions of all the birds I found that had hit the windows and died. Um, after she sent me the book, I started researching where I could get my own hawk um, to train. At that point, my husband um, found a dead hawk on our road that had been hit by a car. This is a side note. Um, it's uh, happened at just the moment when he had adamantly requested that I remove all of my dead stuff out of our family freezer, which I did. So the fact that he sent me a text shortly after that that said, hawk dead, hit by car, sad face emoji. Do you want me to bag it? I tell this story often as one of the true indicators of the enduring power of love. And it's probably ironically the most optimistic section of this talk, sad face emoji. Um, I immediately started to worry, hence my guilt, that a higher power was confusing my Google searches and based on my history and past work was delivering me this misguided dead gift. Um, but as to not seem ungrateful, I made the piece. The stop motion in this and most of the work in this series is halting and sporadic as if to both reveal its deadness, but suggest aliveness. I want to lessen the distance between these things that we think of as oppositional, these things that are animate and inanimate, alive and dead. Just for a moment, I wanna float in the suspension of disbelief that is the uncategorized. I wanna lessen the gap while not really fooling anyone. The work itself is about misguided hope of connection and false promise. The woman hopes to approach wildness to make or pet or even um, have a pet is an affront to what it means to be wild. The hawk also hopes to steal the mink stole made of animals whose life have already been stolen. It's a non-delectable false promise, which is the oldest trick in the book. But Speaking of old books, I want to circle back around to another structural reference. I have long been interested in Darwin's use of pigeons, but this summer I sat down in earnest to read on the origins of species by means of natural selection. We have this beautiful copy in the um, library. <clears throat> uh, it, oh, let me turn the. Um, I was struck by the fact that it was such a page turner. Um, it's no wonder it was the bestseller and how simultaneously topically expansive and specific it is. His gift, um, it seems, was that he was both this generalist and the specialist, um, one not precluding the other. Um, I was also struck by his use of metaphor and his use of close reads and observational aesthetics. While he was said to be a poor draftsperson and maybe despised dissection, he made up for this with his ability to create connection between seemingly desperate investigations and then to make them understandable and digestible through clear but often really flurred descriptions um, and metaphor. I find Darwin's original writing to be very relevant to art making and have a theory that studying art was critical for Darwin, which he said to have done briefly um, in Cambridge. It was just a touch, but it did it. Um, there are two specific subjects that are illustrated in Origins of Species that relate to my practice more generally. One is his discussion of sporting plants. 
or bud spores. These are natural mutations with different observable characteristics or traits from the rest of the plant. And in many cases, the bud spore can be vegetatively propagate, propagated, thereby preserving this novel phenotype without sexual reproduction. This is really exciting because it's exactly akin to what happens in my studio, vegetative propagation. <laughs> um, bodies of work can suddenly create variants. There is, it's important to me to become adept at noticing moments when something I know produces an oddity or a bud sport mutation and to propagate it. I like nectarines and it was definitely not what mama and papa peach expected, right? So if ignored, the mutation will just fold back in. But if I graft it onto my practice, I can cultivate something new related to what I'm working on, um, but an offshoot. Um, this is where I get most excited. And it also puts me in a little bit of a place in between fields. Um, the work that I'm, uh, you're looking at right now is an example of this. Um, it is, I'm taking my mother's high school um, biology book, which I have had for years and absolutely poured over. Um, it's fascinating. For example, did you know, I know some of you may know this, um, that according to this book, um, when a tadpole loses its tail, it gains another chamber in its heart. I feel like that is so ripe for metaphor, um, but let's, let's put that to the side. So I'm using the transparency and illustrations to take apart and put back together this frog. The sound as well is a bit of a dissection. This is a recording from the middle of Donna's pond with both an underwater microphone and an above water microphone. Here I am slowly removing one frequency at a time as each of the frog layer of the frog is removed and then add it back as the frog is reconstructed. With each layer, an insect from the environment is removed, an aspect of the environment is removed, a sound is removed. Um, this is an impossibility, of course, as dissection and, removable, and removal have these irreversible consequences. So this piece imagines that this sort of collateral damage of dissection isn't permanent. Um, so, while Darwin is a consummate collector, I'm really intrigued about his work on what can be observed but not collected. Here, I think of Darwin in the early days of trying to prove evolution. He has this hunch and like a detective, he's collecting evidence and piecing together a massive puzzle by looking at minute details and the microscopic to be able to depict the macroscopic picture constructed in geological time. Um, he's looking at the banal, pigeons and irises, two of my favorite things um, to address the unseen. He's creating a map, a set of information that's bigger than what we can experience or observe. Um, observations split over time and space, but when connected, create something impossible to observe, but possible to know. To me, this is clearly the arena of art. Um, I, this last work that I want to talk about is, um, is a piece that is made with, um, with uh, uh, Veronica Ludlow. And she is also an artist um, and works for the uh, Knoxville Art Museum as well. And this is a reconstructed piece. So what you're seeing here is two parts of it. One would be just two of Veronica up on um, projected larger than life. And on the wall across from it would be these two bucks that over the course of the whole exhibition slowly become obscured by all of this hair so that they are no longer even viewable. Um, the work itself transpired in a really interesting way. I saw Veronica long before I knew her, and I really saw the whole piece as soon as I, as I saw her, but it's very, very creepy to follow someone around and say, can I film you 
brushing your hair. That's just not okay. So after a while, I, um, I actually uh, became acquaintance with her and friends with her and eventually asked her if I could film this piece of her. Um, and when she came into the studio, um, the, first, the first go at it, it didn't work. Um, I didn't like my framing. I didn't like a lot about it. And so I asked her to come back. And when she came back, she um, actually came in and she had a whole lot of materials with her. And then she held up these two bags and she said, I don't know if you could use these, but I thought you might. It's all the hair that, um, I, that from my brushes for the last 15 years. And it was so absolutely beautiful. And so what you see at her feet are the, this a massive collection of hair. What I think about this piece is one, how it so wholly connected the piece itself or uh, completed the piece itself for her to include this really slow collection of material. And at the same time, what you see is something perpetual and repetitive in every day. And so the sort of idea of these two versions of time coalescing became what the piece more um, largely um, talked about. Um, I'm perpetually caught by the use of animals as material in my own work. Um, humans relationship to animals is highlighted in another text that I'm, uh, I go back to every year. It's John Berger's um, 1977 essay, Why We Look at Animals. I reread this every few years and ask myself if I have a question answer to the question and I wonder at my own culpability. So his critique of corporate capitalism, which leads to the marginalization of animals as mere spectacle and commodity, also focuses on something that Berger feels cannot be saved. He feels that's the look between animal and person. He says, Therein lies the ultimate consequence of their marginalization, that look between animal and man, which may have played a crucial role in the development of human society and with which, in any case, all men had always lived until less than a century ago has been extinguished. I also recognize that disappointment leaked from futility exudes from my work. Perhaps though, to feel this disappointment is at times the only place of solace and acknowledgement of what is lost and that that is real. So about disappointment, Berger says, the zoo cannot, um, cannot but disappoint. The public purpose of zoos is to offer visitors the opportunity of looking at animals, yet nowhere in a zoo can the stranger encounter the look of an animal. At the most, the animal's gaze flickered and pass on. They look sideways. They have been immunized to encounter because nothing can anymore occupy a central place in their attention. And this work, um, of, of Veronica, the animal's gaze, gaze is both fake and then further obscured. So almost layering one kind of obscuring onto another. Ironically, every year I do what I do. I, I do the same thing after reading Berger's essay and asking myself these questions. And that is I go to the zoo. And I have to admit, I love the zoo, not intellectually or politically or ethically, but I love looking at animals. Um, in doing this, I hold out this sort of shred of hope that I will learn something about them or me or us. And for a second, I'll believe this fallacy that the connection is real or worth it, despite what Berger says. Um, I want to believe that this connection will transcend into other ways of caring about the world around us. And we might, because of this exposure, do less harm in the bigger picture. In this sort of larger answer about why we uh, look at animals, the answer is always for me to unsteady or unfix this order or to detaxonomize for a second and perhaps even to, li to live in some sort of in-betweenness for at least a moment. Okay, thank you.
let's see. Let's pop it here. Monica, are you back? I'm back. Can Hi. you see me? I see you. You can, yeah. good. Oh, that's good, thank you. <laughs> yeah, Veronica is still gonna be brushing her hair for another 30 minutes, so <laughs> we can check back in on what it looks like in a minute. Okay, good, I hope we will do that. First yeah. of all, I just wanna say, I, I don't, I, I just, I, I have to say this. Um, I just want to thank Professor Bivens so much for this wonderful and inspiring talk. And I'm not kidding. I, I want I want everyone who's on this call to hear this. And some of you are faculty members, and some of you are are local members of the community, and maybe you're even members of of a, of a larger community of just people who like to think about things. Um, whoever you are, I want you all to hear this. The greatest pleasure of working at the University of Tennessee Knoxville is getting to meet your colleagues and hear what they work on. Because I agree, people that I work with. Professor Bivens and I don't work together on a daily basis, but we we are part yes. of this yes. team, right? That's right. I just want to say what a banquet it is. And so thank you very much for that. It was absolutely rich and gorgeous and wonderful. I loved it. And it was also, there was a bit of stand up in there too, which I think is, you know, apropos on a Thursday evening. It's Thursday, right. <laughs> that's, right. that's what you do on Thursdays, as I understand it. I think so too. I think that's right. So there are some questions in the chat uh, or in the Q&A, and I would like to sort of if I may, I'd like to sort of feed you some of those questions. I'm not sure if you, can you see them? Yes. Hey, Todd. Our wonderful colleague, Todd Freeberg, who's one of my favorite colleagues, really. So good. Such a great colleague. Well, would you like to just look yourself? Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so, so Todd is asking um, if I've thought um, about having a very slowly moving camera uh, moving through a natural space to add perhaps to an additional dimension in your work. Actually, Todd, I was hoping to just tag along with you on all of your research. Um, Todd um, is uh, has amazing work dealing with um, chickadees. And um, anyway, I don't know if that was an invitation, but um, I'm ready for it. Um, yeah, I think about these things all the time. I mean, the two things that I'm working on right now, um, oh God, that's a lie. The 100 things that I'm working on right now, the 100 loose ends that I have not completed right now, um, but one of them includes sort of walking um, through spaces and, um, and recording both um, above ground and underwater. Um, and really engaging in this deep listening of space. And so your idea of pairing that with very slow moving cameras through natural spaces seems very appropriate and, um, and, and, and a very logical next step. I will add that to the docket, Todd, and I will be ready for your next research trip. Um, oh. <laughs> Um, let's see. Um, hi, Kelly Wood. Good to see you. Um, let's see. Bave. Hi, Bave. It says, um, uh, women play a key role in your work as both subject and collaborators. Women um, as also framed often as natural. Talk about this if you would. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, I... <laughs> In a lot of ways, I'm uncomfortable with the our human presence in the natural world. The fact that we, um, you know, the the that that our our presence is not benign. And so, in one way, the relationship between the women in all of these scenarios are one of both admiration, but also like slight conflict to even the presence and the desire to. Um, to be close to something that is inherently um, in need of protection from us. And so there's both, there's this care, but then there's also this danger. And so I'm thinking about both of those things. I don't see the, the um, female figures as necessarily benign. I don't think of them as benign, um, but I do think of them as companions, the way that companions can be not benign. <laughs> um, I hope that was, I hope that answered. Um, 
Oh, good. Todd said it was an invitation, just for the record, everybody. Um, thank you. Um, hi, Althea. Thanks for coming. Um, um, so uh, let's see. Um, can you talk about hair? It appears in a lot of your pieces. Sometimes it seems threatening. Sometimes it seems soft as an aspect of care. Um, what's with hair and your artistic vision? It's a really good. It's a really good question. And um, um, some of my early work with um, a group called the Bridge Club. Um, I think this is where it started. No, 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 no. No. Let me back up. It started actually in. Um, it started actually in graduate school when I was making, you know, everybody in graduate school like gets stuck, I assume. I've never seen somebody not get stuck. Um, and so in, for me, when I got stuck, um, this sounds crazy now that I'm saying it out loud. All right, we're friends here, right? So when I would get stuck, I had this very bad wig and a and I would put on these alligator skin pumps and this very bad wig and I um, and this this dress that I made this house dress that I made and I would sit and I would look at my work and I would pretend to smoke um, and I, I'm gonna pretend now and so I would pretend to smoke and I would be like what does this work need and I called myself Barbara and and I. And, and so this idea of hair to sort of become, like to change so instrumentally my identity. Um, and, and so I, I, I think this aspect of, um, I think this aspect of this thing on, this thing that is so cared for, but is, um, and so revered, but is actually this dead protein on your head that once in the, in the drain of the bathroom, in the bathtub drain is the grossest thing ever, um, which is why you should not have bar soap because it gets stuck to it. But that's another, that's a whole nother subcategory. So this thing that is both really um, repulsive, but also really um, sort of uh, delightful, that kind of push and pull in, intrigues me as, as with the sort of intricately uh, connected ideas of female identity and hair. Um, yes. Oh my gosh, Kelly, just Kelly Wood, so brilliant. Um, just asked this question and um, I didn't, I, I, I did not get into this whole um, topic of taxidermy and taxonomy and sort of our desire to control and order and categorize and define um, and the sort of misguidedness of it. But I do want to talk about it for just a second. One of the other things that I found so illuminating um, when um, doing more research on on Darwin is his absolute um, sort of um, uh, uh, non-hierarchical approach to taxonomy. And, um, you know, so as he categorized and, and named and um, tested, and, you know, he's not saying this is higher, this is lower. He's saying this all just is. And I was really, really struck by that, especially after reading the book, um, Why Fish Don't Exist. Have y'all read this? Um, it's by Lulu, where is it? Uh, I think it's by Lulu Miller. I could be wrong, but it's Why Fish Don't Exist. And it's really talking about this idea of how dangerous some early um, uh, forays into taxonomy was. And, um, and so, um, that's all to say, Kelly Wood's question here about natural science museums and how they might relate to uh, my work is another subcategory of things that I'm interested in. I'm really interested in museums of museums. So museums of collections where the collection doesn't shift and change to address our shifting ideas, but rather we freeze them. I love freezing things. We freeze them in a time and space and 
and then look at what that means more holistically within that moment. And so this idea of the natural history museums, I um, went to uh, the Chicago Natural History Museum um, uh, countless times in high school. And, um, and it was massively problematic at this point. And when I went back later as an adult, I, I wanted to look at what that meant about that moment in collection and it was completely erased. And so this idea of the erasure of um, how we view something as determined by how we collect or how we display is really fascinating. Um, and I really do hope, uh, as the question talks about is, um, I really do hope that Natural History Museums become incredibly fascinated with my work and bring me onto their boards and then allow me to make a um, hermetically sealed variation of their museum for perpetuity. I think there's oh, one, one more sort okay. of very much a fan-based question. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, Glenn Bowden asked if the Bridge Club will be collaborating again. I actually called them after we talked and after, uh, after the, the last time um, you mentioned that. And, um, and I think actually, Glenn, you have um, initiated a reunion tour. So I'm really excited about that. This is my collaborative group. Um, and we went to graduate school together and started working together and really um, had about, 12 or 13 years of pretty intense work together. Um, uh, we've all been making our own bodies of work and done less collaborative work lately, but um, thanks to Glenn Bowden, we are probably going to be um, wildly famous and touring soon. Thank you, Glenn. <laughs> yeah. Let's hope so. And, and, and our good colleague, Lisa Schoenbach has a lovely and very fascinating question too. Oh, is she? Oh. Oh man. Oh, Lacey, I've got, I've, look what I have. Oh, look at this. I was gonna talk about this as well. Um, you might even wanna read it out, Emily, because yeah. it's pretty fascinating in its own right. <laughs> oh yes, yes. Okay, um, uh, I'm just sharing the coincidence that I was teaching Wuthering Heights today, and there's a scene where Catherine is pulling out the feathers, I know, by the handful from her pillow, then identifying the, def the different sources of the feathers. At one point, she says, they put pigeon feathers in the pillow. I love that, I love that part. No wonder I, um, no wonder I couldn't die. So there are pigeons, dead animals, and it's so relevant to your interest. Public tw uh, published 12 years before Darwin's Origins of Species. I love that passage. And I am just, thank you. That's the best. That's the best. This is, a book, this is a book that Lisi um, recommended to me and it's become my new, um, I don't know. I can't stop talking about it. I can't stop reading it. I can't stop recommending it. It's how to do nothing, resisting the attention economy. Um, anyway, um, this is this kind of notion of how we become observers of the world and um, really talks about um, notions of observing the banal as a way to reconnect with both the natural world, but ourselves as well. So a beautiful recommendation. Actually, you've made a lot of amazing literary recommendations this evening from Darwin's Origin of Species to to losing Guattari to I don't even remember all of them. There were oh well then there's my there's my mom's um there's my mom's uh, high school biology book. It's missing the it's missing the front page, so I have no idea how you can find it, but I will tell you it is. It is a page turner. Um, let's see. Oh, the other one that I didn't bring up, but I will. It's um, it's it's this. It's called um, the homing pigeon. It's how I learned how to be um, a pigeoneer from the War Department, published January 1945. It's um, it's it's the best. It's the best um, how to on homing pigeons. If anyone's interested. I am actually. I'm very interested. Well, we live. I can't close believe. 
I can't believe that it's been so many years since I went to the Knox County Fair. I'm, I'm going next year. I'm telling you. Um, also, if you get homing pigeons, we live close enough that we could do quite a few test flights back and forth. No more email for us, Monica. Wow. Okay. I'm really inspired now. Pigeon Emily, this has only. been an amazing evening. This has been an incredible talk um, and, um, and wonderful questions from our colleagues and, and others. I want to see if there's like one last question because we just have a couple of minutes left. And, and I'll go ahead and um, I'll go ahead and share just so you can see um, Veronica's progress here. Oh yeah. Here we go. So this is, uh, eventually it's completely covered up, but again, that would take the entirety of the entire exhibition. Agreed. Um, Todd just said, Glenn Bowden is a superhero. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed, more generally. Thank you so much, Emily. And I just wanna say one, one I wanna give one, one more plug to our Humanity Center and to say that, unfortunately, this is our last Cocktails and Conversations for this semester, but we have a whole new season starting, of course, um, in, in the spring semester. I think our first talk, it's in February, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the date off the top of my head, but it's all available on our website. So please visit the UTHC uh, website um, for more information about all kinds of talks, not just Cocktails and Conversations, but also public books. One more time, Enormous thanks to Professor Bivens. It was an absolute delight. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. I know this is late on a Thursday and there was much going on. So I really appreciate um, you all for coming out. And thank you, Monica. Thank you, Amy. My pleasure. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. <laughs>